Hi, this is Jazz Obrecht, and welcome to my Talking Guitar podcast with Jason Becker. In 1990, Jason was rapidly ascending the heights of guitar stardom. The 21-year-old had already released two cacophony albums with co-guitarist Marty Friedman, as well as his acclaimed 1989 solo album, Perpetual Burn. Most notable of all, Jason had just completed the sessions for David Lee Ross' A Little Ain't Enough. Fans were anxiously anticipating Ross' new album and upcoming tour. After all, David previously performed alongside Eddie Van Halen and Steve Vai. Sadly, a tour with Jason Becker on guitar was not to be. Just a few days before our interview, Jason was diagnosed with ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. In his book, Crazy from the Heat, Dave praised Jason as, quote, the quiet, kindest, gentlest, most flexible, absorbing, want-to-learn spirit that I've ever really worked with. This parallels my observations of Jason. To help prepare me for our December 13th, 1990 phone interview, Jason sent me an advanced cassette of A Little Ain't Enough with the request that I safeguard the music until its official release. During our interview, he spoke at length about the Dave Lee Ross sessions, Marty Friedman and Cacophony, his views on guitars and amps, his musical upbringings, and more. Before we get started, I want to thank Jason for giving me permission to air this Talking Guitar podcast. Here's our conversation. Hello? Jason. Yeah. Jazz Obrecht. Hey, Jazz. How you doing? Good, man. Is this a good time to talk? Sure, this is okay. Well, I sure love you playing on the record. Man. Oh, thanks a lot, man. I hope you don't mind. I listened to it with my boss, too. He wanted to hear it. Okay. Which, who, who's he? Tom Wheeler. Okay, Tom Wheeler. I he, knows, he knows we have to keep our mouths shut. But, okay, great. But, uh, man, you did a great job. Thanks a lot, Jazz. Good to hear. Did uh, you feel any special... Uh, is, this, is this a good time to talk? Sure, man. Did you feel any like special pressure knowing that you were following in the footsteps of Eddie and Steve Vai? No, not not really. Um, you know, you, you can't think about that. Yet. You know, they they when Dave listened to me and you know the guys heard me, you know they don't want another Eddie or another Steve. You know they want, you know they want me for what I do. You know, so you know there's there's no way. You know, I don't play like Steve or Eddie, so. There was no pressure, you know. I just do what I do. You know, some people are going to like it, you know, more. Some people aren't going to like it as much. So, you know, the only thing you can do is play and make yourself happy. And making Dave happy is good, too. What was the... I can imagine. <laughs> what, you know, um, given... Uh, I've known Dave since the band did their first album. Given his uh, passion for control, uh -huh. I'm wondering, like, what kind of input he had on what you played. Well, you know, it was really cool. I. Uh, you know, you hear a lot of stories about Dave and stuff. And uh, when I was going in, you know, I don't know what to expect. And uh, I was very pleasantly surprised, as you know, especially as far as recording, because he had a lot of input, and you know, he wanted he wanted everything to be special and and to fit. And uh, it wasn't like he told me anything to do. It was like, why don't you try this and this? And, you know, I'd try it and you'd think, well, you know, cool. What about trying this and this? And, and you know, and he, 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 you know, tried to pull things out of me that I would do myself, you know. So he, there was no, it wasn't like, you know, do this, you know. It right. It was more, uh, you know, just go for it and we'll see, you know, where to go from there. What, what was the road that led you into that gig? Gosh, what was the road? Um. Uh, well, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I associate you with being with Cacophony and living right. up around Nevada. Well, I, was, I was in Cacophony. Right. And uh, I I had just gotten out of the band, you know, not what? not even knowing about the Dave thing or anything. What year? When was this? This was, you know, this was less, this was about a month uh, before I started playing with Dave in 89, late 89, I guess. Okay. And, uh... So I got that out of that band just because I wanted it to be, uh, you know, I wanted more of a, um, uh, a little more blues in there, and, uh, a little more of a pop thing, and I just kind of wanted to start fresh, you know. But 
even though, you know, Marty is my best friend and we always play together all the time. Right. I just wanted something new. Um, so, uh, you know, I started, so I started writing tunes, you know, that are more like Dave for, you know, Mike Varney. And uh, so he really liked them. And I think, uh, you know, it was a matter of Mike Varney and Greg Bissonette talking. And, you know, that, so I went down and auditioned for him. What was the, could you describe the audition? Oh, it was great. It was, you know, I got there and uh, I was expecting. To you know, Dave's house? Huh? Was it to Dave's dad's house? Yeah, Dave's house. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And, you know, they're hanging out, Dave's eating cereal. And it, it was great, you know, because they were just like normal people and they're about the nicest guys I've ever met, you know, the guys in the band. Uh, and they just really made it easy. It was, it was really easy. It, you know, it was just a matter of going and playing. What kind of stuff did you play? Yeah, we played uh, Hot for Teacher and Gigolo and. couple of the new tunes. Now, had you like woodshedded and learned all this before you went down? Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. It was it was it wasn't that hard to learn. Um so yeah, I, I definitely, you know, got it down. It's I learned the songs, you know, the way the songs were. On the records? On the records. Because so, they could see they'd heard a tape of me before. So they knew that you know, I had ideas and stuff. So they just wanted to make sure I could cop the, the vibes. Jason, did any of the songs you were writing uh, make it onto the record in any way? Uh, two songs I wrote. Um, the last two on the record, Showtime and Dropping the Bucket. I wondered about Dropping the Bucket because it's so guitar intensive. It seems yeah. like to have come from a guitar player. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, most of the songs were written when I got in the band. Really? Yeah. Um... Did you hear, did you do you have songwriting credits on other songs? Mm, nope. Okay. I, uh, gosh, you know, lots of different people wrote on the record. Steve Hunter wrote quite a few tunes with the keyboard player Brett. Who's that? Brett what? Brett Tuggle. T U G G L E. Uh, T. Yep, that's it. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know, Dave writes the lyrics. To the tunes. Did he write the lyrics to Showtime and Drop in the Bucket? Yeah, I. See, when I went in there, they had all these tunes, and I and they said, you know, if you've got any tunes, by all means. And they had so many great tunes, all I wanted to do was say, okay, what is it missing? And write a tune, you know, what it was missing. Because, you know, why write another, you know, Tell the Truth or, or Little Ain't Enough when there's already, you know, one that's really cool. And it kind of filled in the gap. Did you, did, when you got there, were there demo tapes to work with, or what? Yeah, they had done little demo tapes. Um, with guitar? Yeah, with guitar. They they, they were using a guy, uh, I think his name is Rocket Roche, and uh, he's a really good player. So they had some demos with him. I'm not I'm not sure, but I think he co-wrote maybe a couple of the tunes. I'm not sure which one. Why didn't they use him in the band, do you know? Um... I can't really say because I don't know for sure. I have, you know, my ideas, but okay, good enough. Huh? What were the sessions like when you actually went in to record? It was really cool. It was really mellow, really easy. And, uh, um, it, you know, Bob Rock's a guitar player too. Who? So, uh, Bob Rock who produced it. And, uh, Is that B R O C K? B O B R O C K. Yeah. Bob Rock. Bob Rock. What's his real name? Well, you know, to be honest, they told me that's his real name. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Rock. <laughs> right. My name's but, uh, Jack Smith. It's, a, it's an appropriate name. Yeah. Uh, he's a, he's a great guy, good producer, and uh, there there wasn't really pressure, you know. It. You know what's funny is we uh, did a a demo of some of the songs uh-huh. before we went in you know, up to Vancouver to record. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the solos I did on that were kind of, I sort of winged them and made them up at the time. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, you know, this is fine for now, but I can make them up later. But Dave, like, you know, fell in love with half of them. So I had to, like, re cop what I did. Really? But that was cool, you yeah. know, because they came out good. But uh, the recording... It, 
um, it was just loads of fun. Did yeah. Dave Dave play any guitar? No, he didn't play any. No, you mentioned that Hunter played on two cuts. Yeah, he actually played on all the cuts, but Showtime. Really? Yeah, doing like he does, like the popping rhythms in Forty Below, and uh, he does the uh, finger style stuff. Um, it's it's you know the popping. Okay. The, the snapping rhythms and, and that, uh-huh. and uh, um, you know he me and him trade off in uh, sensible yeah. shoes. Well, yeah, he does. He does a little slide in sensible shoes, and we trade off in hammerhead shark. That's a great little bit you do in there, man. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a fun one. That it's, is. I like I like to trade off, and it wasn't. Uh, it was a friendly thing. You know? Were you both set up in the studio at the same time? Um. No, we weren't actually. He did his parts first. So actually, I got I got lucky because I got to. Uh, I didn't have to, you know, do it fresh. Right. You know, I got to hear what he did. You know, come up with my part. Did you get a chance to meet him? Who? Hunter. Oh, we're best friends. Oh, cool. Yeah, we uh, we like hung out all the time in, in uh, Vancouver, and we still see. I'm actually gonna see him tonight. Man, I remember seeing him with uh, Lou Reed and Alice Cooper when I yeah. was a kid. Yeah. He must be an old guy by now. Yeah, he's 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 as old as my dad. Really? Yeah, so we we always joke about that. Did you uh, relate as uh, two regular guys though? Oh, definitely. We we definitely get along. Like, uh, he's really one of my best friends. That's great, man. Yeah. Huh. Good guy. What are, are your favorite tracks on the album that you did? Or, it, it, my favorites change every day. I, yeah. You know. Uh, a little ain't enough one day, tell the truth the next day, uh, drop in the bucket the next day. Little little parts in each song that I like. It yeah. depends on what mood I'm in. You sure I have a chance to do some fire breathing solos on this record. Yeah, I got I got a chance. I got a chance to blaze on the last couple. <laughs> yeah, especially those. Yeah, yeah. It seemed like with the drop in the bucket, it's almost like you saved your best stuff for the last song. Yeah, that's that's what I've I've heard people tell me that. It's uh, it's kind of that way. I wanted to, uh, you know, because my other records are pretty much blaze from start to finish. Right. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I love doing that, but, you know, I wanted it to be a little more. I wanted, I didn't want people to say, oh, you know, whatever. Yeah. But then again, you know, it's an exciting thing, and I like to put it in there. So. Yeah. But actually, you know, to be honest, I didn't choose the sequence of the record, so maybe that's what Dave wanted. Yeah. How did those sessions compare with the sessions you, you did for uh, Varney? Oh, well, with for Varney, uh, me and Marty uh, went in, and Varney didn't even show up. It was just like, go ahead, you guys, record whatever you want. So we got to do everything we wanted. And, uh-huh. you know, it'd take a month, and the only worry was like, oh, are you guys spending too much time, too much money, you know? And, uh, of course... You know, uh, the vocals. The vocals were a little less of a concern in cacophony. Yeah. But, uh, but um, oh, it was just it was just the most incredible experience. Doing that Vancouver. record, those right? Ra- oh, in Vancouver. Yeah. Even uh, you know, I'd rather have a producer telling me, you know, what, you know, how to change things and how to make it kind of cooler because I tend to, you know. Which is which is kind of cool for what it is, but I tend to want to jam cool licks in every second, you know. Without, I used to think, you know, I don't want a second of boring parts. I want it all to be, you know, incredible. But this was, it, I I really liked being. Uh, it wasn't like I was stifled. It uh-huh. was just, you know, why don't you, why don't you try this and it would be more effective if you wait here, don't do it here, you know. So it it was really, I consider it like a learning thing. I really am into learning, so it was fun. How old were you when you produced Perpetual Burn? Uh, I was 18. So you're 20 now? 21 now. 21? Yeah. That's amazing. That's the same age when Eddie started out with Van Halen. Oh, it is, huh? Yep. That's right. Yeah. In the song, uh, Sensible Shoes, you know, is there an acoustic guitar? Is there an acoustic guitar? You know, I don't think so. That one, uh, that one, and tell the truth, I left the scratch tracks that I did. You know, 
when we were recording for like the drums and the bass. We'd all play together and they would sing. And so we left, you know, the scratch tracks on those. Did you play the real reverb, reverb drench parts? The reverb. The sort of swampy uh, rhythm? The swampy little. Um, it's almost it was a, like the. It's almost the, like the Lee on there? Yeah. The little vibrato. No, Steve did that. Okay. That's, a, that's a hip part, huh? That sure is. Yeah. He's I, good at that, like, old blues kind of stuff. And he he did a little bit of slide in there, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, he did a little bit of slide, yeah. yeah. Some of this, it's funny because we take turns doing that little lick, the da 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 you know, because sometimes it's him doing slide and sometimes it's me with you know, the bar. It's hard to tell. Babies on Fire is a cool combination of, of vibe and attitude. Yeah, yeah, I like that one. That one, that one, uh, I think that's Dave's best singing. Like in a long time, really sounds really tough on that one. But that solo, uh, it it was kind of a weird thing I did. I took a melody and uh, and and played it forwards. And uh -huh. I flipped the tape and learned it backwards. Right. Learned how to play it backwards. And played it on the tape and turned it over towards the same melody, only it's backwards. The attack of the notes at the end of the note instead exactly. of the beginning. It's got a nice, uh, thick buildup of guitar. It's almost like kind of Houses of the Holy type sound. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a thick one. Yeah. Did Dave ever like tell you more guitar, more guitar? Does that come from him? No, I don't think he ever had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was the least of his concern. Did they ever want you to abridge your parts? Uh, what do you mean abridge? Uh, edit them down? Um, like remove stuff? Yeah, you know, we'd go over solos. Sometimes he'd say, you know, that lick there isn't necessary, or why don't we stick it over here? Yeah, yeah, we we uh, we worked on the solo. Did you were the, the solos pieced together? No, the, it was pretty much, you know, we'd figure out the vibe and sometimes some of the parts we'd want them to be in there. But uh, you know, I'd punch them, but I I never got into the, you know, putting tracks, you know, doing a bunch of tracks. Although, you know, Bob Rock could have done that when I was there. So, maybe. But listening back, you'd probably tell, huh? Yeah. So was it recorded that. digitally? Uh, yeah, we did that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, very cool. The whole record was? Yeah, I believe so. Wow. Yeah. Well, what's, uh, what did you learn about getting a good guitar sound by working on that record? Any new tricks or ideas? Well, Suggestions? Uh, I'll tell you what I learned about getting a good guitar sound. I learned that um, it's it's not an easy thing. <laughs> it's uh, it's you're not going to go in there just because you're in an expensive studio and get good tone. Um, it's uh, it it kind of made me you know uh, learn that it has to come out of playing. You know, it uh, I think. Tone has a lot to do with your playing, but uh, yeah, you know that's a good one. I didn't. It's just a matter of having the cool head, I guess. <laughs> Did you have to change your gear at all? Yeah, well, I kind of wanted different tones on each of the tunes, so it basically we had about eight Marshalls in there that we, you know, went back and forth from. I used about a million different guitars too. Really? Yeah. I used like PVs, Carvins, Ibanez, ESPs. Valley Arts. Just any guitar you can think of. Hamers. Why? Um, just just for a different different feel. Did any of them tend to show up uh, in the more prominent places? Um, to be honest, it's quite even. Really? It's quite even. Like I'd pick a guitar for a certain tune. Would it be because of that guitar's tone or just for something different? Like, yeah, mainly the tone. The tone. Like I used the Les Paul on, on Little Ain't Enough. An ESP on Lady Luck, and you know, just in a Valley Arts on. Uh, guess I forget which one I used. See, I kind of forget too. But uh, yeah, I don't. You know, I don't. I just want to go to a different. Why don't you use uh, eight different brands of amps too, then? Well, because Marshall's the coolest amp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know. What do you What do you look for in a Marshall? 
What do I look like for? Like if you're going to go test one out, what what what's your road test? What's your Well, you know, even that, I'm I'm I haven't been much of a uh, searcher. I just find the cool Marshall mainly some beef. Yeah, you know, it has to have a lot of meat. Uh, not a lot of. Uh, sometimes they have this thinking high end thing happen, but just a lot of meat, and then you can you can always add stuff. Did you have a lot of, 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 of processing gear there? No, it was. Uh, it kind of bothered me at first. I, uh, I, it was just Marshall, and like nothing else, no reverb, no nothing. Guitar and amp. Right. Mic amplifier. Amp. Yep. And see ya. So that uh, it's not very inspiring to play. So you have to really pull it out of you, which was a challenge, and that was really fun. It got to be fun at first. I was like, "What's the deal? Come on." You know, let's put, let's put some juice, let's juice that puppy up. But but uh, it really got, it, it was really fun. Did they tend to add um, sound processing once you had it on tape? Or? Yeah, once it was on tape, they, you know, in the mix, they slapped that stuff on. Huh. Interesting. Did you have uh, any special requirements on your guitars? Um, yeah, I, I use 8 to 46. That's, yeah. that's the only requirement. What about the whammy setup? Um, no, not really. You know, whatever. As long as I can yank back a little bit, that's enough. So it doesn't matter if it's Kayla or Floyd or... Uh, yeah, actually, it has to be Floyd. Why? Or, you know, Ibanez or whatever. I used Kayla for a while, but uh, they don't stay in tune, really. Really? Or at least mine did. Yeah. Put it that way. Hmm. I detect a lot of blues influence in your playing, Jason. Yeah, you know, that's, that's from... Early on, my uncle plays blues guitar. What's his name? Uh, his name's Ron. Ron? Uh, yeah, Ron Becker. And uh, he, uh, you know, he's into Roy Buchanan and, and Clapton and all those guys. So I kind of got it from him. It, uh, How old were you? Uh, I was five when I started. No kidding. Yeah. And uh, my dad plays classical, so that's kind of why I, you know, going back and forth from, you know, doing those things. But, uh, yeah, I... Uh, a lot of Clapton, a lot of, you know, my first influence was Dylan, you know, so I'm in the At rock which rock. period? At, um, you know, from old to... Uh, the acoustic folk singer, Dylan? That, as well as, like, the Rolling Stone and all those things, up to, like, Desire and uh, Blood on the Tracks. So you must yeah. be very song-oriented. Uh, what now? You must be real song-oriented. Well, kind of, you know, it's funny because my guitar playing... You know, if you listen to it, it doesn't really seem like it's influenced by Dylan. But uh, I don't know what it is. There's something about, I don't know, maybe it was, you know, when I listened to it, I remember when I was five, six, seven. So. Were you, like, practicing back then a lot? Yeah, I uh, I, I learned, like, every Dylan thing. And uh, I sang and played the harmonica in front of, you know, my school. With an acoustic guitar? Yeah. Yeah, no the, kidding. The full-on Mr. Tambourine Man. You don't have a photo of that, do you? Uh, I, I think I do. It'd be great to run with the article, man. I'm telling you. I should, I'm sure. I'm going to look for it. <laughs> That'd I'll be... look for it because it's really funny. We're doing a cover story on Stevie Ray and Jimmy Vaughn, and we're running a, maybe a picture or two of them as kids, so it'd be in the spirit of the issue. That's great. There you go. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, yeah, I'll have to look for that. Then. That's most amusing. Did you, like, take lessons and all that? Um, not really. I, not until I was 14. I took lessons from Dave Kramer then. Kramer? Kramer. Oh, yeah, right. Um, yeah. He's a, I guess he did a record with Miles Davis. Right. And uh, incredible player. I got to go take another lesson. From that. When did you, like, break away from imitation and, and just branch into innovation as a player? Um. Ooh, that's, that's a good question. I guess right before I met Marty, and especially when I met Marty, because he was doing stuff that I'd never heard. And I was like, well, you know, what's wrong with me? Why can't I? You know, was I, this in, like, junior high? Uh, no, that was in high school. Like, I guess my junior year. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's about when I started. Where, where were you guys going to school? Well, he he's actually older than I am. So, he... He wasn't in school. I was, I went to school in Richmond, a school called Kennedy High. Yeah. Was like he a local hero or a hotshot? No, he just gave lessons. 
stuff. He was he was kind of a local hero in Hawaii. He yeah. had a band called Hawaii. Uh, you know, quite a few years before then. But he he moved to San Francisco because I guess he was going to work with Mike. So, so is, would he would he be one of the major influences on your development? Yeah, I think so, definitely. Huh. Definitely. What are the what do you perceive as the differences in your styles? Me and Marty. Yeah. Um, Does he have strengths that you admire? And... Oh yeah, I think he has. Uh, he has weirder bends. Um, he's he's more into uh, like the Uli thing, and uh, I don't. Know, he's got great uh, phrasing and bending, and he really digs deep into that. Yeah. Whereas I might, uh, I might. Uh, well, actually, at this point, I'm more into that too. So uh, that's a good question. I don't know the difference. It's, the, it's just a matter of listening. Yeah. I never really think about it. A lot of people ask me that. I guess they should think about it. But he's. Uh, it's kind of like he's more of a, just a regular guy, you know, playing uh, playing cool guitar because he likes like full on heavy, like the heaviest, like he's Megadeth. And the heaviest thing, but he's like an incredible guitar player. It's, it's a good question. Mm. Did you do any singing on the album, backup? No, I didn't. No. Were any of the tracks like near completed or well into by the time you joined Dave? Oh, yeah. Um, which ones were? Last Call was pretty much in there. And uh, um, A Little Ain't Enough was a complete tune, but it was more of a keyboard tune, so I had to make it into a guitar tune. What was done with Last Call when you got there? Um, it was that was it was it was pretty much right in there. I just had to, you know, stick a solo to it. Was the uh, like the opening riffs and all that already done? It was already all all there. So that was uh, Steve Hunter who played that? No, who who uh Oh no! You mean as far as the final recording? Right. Oh, I thought you. Um, no, I did. Uh, you know, we both played rhythm on that, and I did solo. So, but uh, and I did the little breakdown. That's a pretty flamboyant solo, you know, with the the growls and the chord parts. And that stuff. one's one of those to where you know we had just done a couple of solos to where it took a long time figuring out you know what the vibe should be and how long you know it should be. And, and what notes it should be. And we were kind of getting tired of that. So we said, okay. He did. And it's funny because Angus Young was uh, recording right right next door. One of my and, faves. And uh, what now? One of my favorites. Yeah, definitely. The greatest vibrato. <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, so so we heard that the, his producer gave him like three takes and, uh, you know, just pieced it together. And so they said, come on, you, you can do that. I said, okay, two takes, and I'll let you piece it together. So I'm, usually I was like, come on, let me do it again. Let me do it again. <laughs> but yeah. this time I was like, ah, I, you know, if Angus can do it, I mean, you know, I'll try it. So, so it worked out, so they pieced together two. Very cool. Did you do all your solos in like two weeks, or was it song by song? It was it was song by song. It was I was there for three months. Uh and it wasn't done, you know, instrument by instrument. It was, you know, more, it finished all the drums. Then, you know, me and Dave and Steve would kind of trade off days. Whenever Dave felt like singing, whenever we felt like playing. So it was funny, you know, we'd have a, quite a few days off now and then. Yeah. We'd hang around in Vancouver. Great little town. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Hey, um, tell me about uh, why you're not touring with Dave. Well, that's because uh, of uh, I have this illness that uh, they say it's called ALS. ALS. Yeah, which is a form of uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, and uh, that that just got into my legs. You know, both actually both of my legs, so much to where I can just barely walk now. So I kind of have to take care of it and uh, you know, go through some programs. Can they reverse it? Well, technically, no, but uh, you know, it's just a matter of trying everything. It's it's actually doing okay. Are you able to ambulate on your own? Walk around? Uh, yeah, I need a cane. Yeah. 
Now, what are your plans uh, for the near future, Jason? Well, I'm gonna I'm working on a solo album, mm-hmm. and uh, that should be quite different, quite new, and quite cool. So I'm not sure when when that's going to be out, but uh, is it for Varney? It'll probably be with Varney, but uh, you know, and I'm sure me and Dave will work together again. What do you th- What's Dave going to do about uh, touring? He's got another guy. Do you know who that is? Yeah, his name is Joe Holmes. Joe Hall. Joe. Joe, Joe Holmes. Joe J J O E H O L M E S. And uh, I haven't even heard him play, uh, but uh, he's a really nice guy. Did he audition people for that? Yeah, he was. I was actually there. We were auditioning for Rhythm Guys, and uh, you know he came and played rhythm. And then I told Dave, you know, about my thing. Probably wasn't going to work out, so I just used him. So Dave was playing on a two guitar band at that time? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's a new thing. Yeah. You know, a nice full thing. It's new for Dave. Yeah. Wow. So are you going to be moving back up here? I think so. Probably January, February. Okay, great. Yeah. Is there anything you want to add to the story, Jason, or something we, we haven't covered that you might want to put in there? Really, I I'm not I'm not the great interview guy. I never know what to say. I just You've done a play. great job, man. And the and the well, the only thing I ever think about, you know, is just playing. And I never really think about you know what I felt at the time, or, or uh, you know. So I I always kind of feel sorry for the guy interviewing me because I just answer the questions. And, you know, don't elaborate, but but yeah. After our interview, a little ain't enough went gold. Meanwhile, the Becker family was told Jason's life expectancy was three to five years. By 1996, he lost the ability to speak, so his father developed a method of communication with um, eye movement. From his wheelchair, Jason continued to compose music with a computer that responds to eye movement. On his 1996 album, Perspective, He wrote that ALS had crippled his body and speech, but not his mind, and the music has kept coming. He followed up with 1999, the Raspberry Jams, and 2003's Blackberry Jams. The Jason Becker Collection came out in 2008. The award-winning documentary, Jason Becker, Not Dead Yet, was released on DVD in 2012, the same year some of his earliest recordings were issued as Boy Meets Guitar. His latest release, Triumphant Hearts, came out in 2018. Again, I want to thank Jason for giving me permission to do this podcast. I also thank the Southern Folklife Collection and my co-producer, Nick Hunt, for making this podcast possible. And thank you, subscribers, for supporting my work. This podcast is Kyrie 2022 by Jazz Obrecht, all rights reserved. Thank you for listening.